Welcome. How important is innovation for prosperity, growth, and technological progress? Joseph Schumpeter, the great economist of the first half of the 20th century, described innovation as a process of creative destruction. Innovation disrupts all technologies and product with innovative ones. What is the process of creative destruction and why does it matter for today's economy? What are its implications for the regulation of competition? To those questions and many others, we are delighted to have Professor Philippe Aguillon to discuss his latest book, The Power of Creative Destruction, <laughs> published at Harvard University Press this month, April 2021. The French, French version was published last year, here it is, uh, co-authored with Céline Antonin and Simon Brunel. Professor Philippe Aguillon, books provide an exceptional account of the power of creative destruction and the importance of innovation on public policies. A review by The Economist, to be published in tomorrow's edition, considered the book to be authoritative and strikingly a bit uh, quite the thing we need in today's uh, difficult economic times. Professor Philippe Aguillon has written, talked and taught about the Schumpeterian approach to public policy for decades now. He is a leading intellectual on the need to adopt a Schumpeterian or dynamic approach to regulations. Former professor of economics at Harvard University, Philippe Hagion is now professor at College of France, at the London School of Economics, and at INSEAD Business School. The writing of the book, starting in the late 2019, based on the lectures that he delivered at the College of France. This book provides a comprehensive overview of the multiple facets of innovation, from macroeconomics to green innovation, the role of the state to spur and not stifle innovation. The breadth uh, of the innovation topics covered by the chapters make this book a must read for anyone interested in the understanding of the causes and implications of innovation in society. For today's discussion, we will focus on chapter four of the book, uh, which relates to the fascinating relationship between competition and innovation. How can we better design innovation-based antitrust enforcement? My name is Orion Portuez. I'm the director of antitrust and innovation at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, the world's top-ranked think tank for science and technology. I am delighted to have f f Professor Philippe uh, Aguillon to discuss his seminal book. Professor Aguillon, thank you for being with us. Thanks. So nice to meet you. Thank you for inviting me. Right. Yeah. So at ATF, uh, we have launched this conversation series titled Dynamic Antitrust to have a more dynamic approach to competition. Mm -hmm. A dynamic view of competition departs from static models. It adopts a Schumpeterian view of antitrust enforcement where disruptive innovation can best provide the effective disciplining effects on incumbent companies. Uh, Philip, uh, Philip, can you explain why we need to move away from static approach to endorse a more dynamic approach to antitrust, what we call at ATF dynamic antitrust. So uh, the, the way I will explain that, I will start from the research I've been working on the rising rents and falling growth. Uh, so we have the chapter of the book called, uh, uh, which is called Secular Stagnation. And in that chapter, uh, we, uh, we show that, you know, a convincing explanation for the decline in uh, TFP growth since the early 2000s in the US is the fact that when you had the IT revolution, some firms, thanks to the IT revolution, the superstar firms, could expand to many sectors of the economy, the Amazon, Facebook, uh, Walmart, uh, uh, Google, of this world. When they, they expanded, that in the first uh, uh, First, it spurred growth, you see what I mean? Then it boosted growth initially. So that's why you see that in the US, between 95 and 2005, growth is, is boosted in the US, TFP growth. But then what happened is that once they invaded all the sectors, they inhibited uh, innovation by other firms. And that's why you have a decline. And they could invade all sectors because there was no bound in their ability to do merger and acquisition. They could essentially go everywhere they wanted. And, uh, and that's why the, the problem is that when deciding about whether, uh, about whether they should be allowed to do a merger and acquisition, 
it was never taken into account <coughs> whether that would uh, inhibit or not subsequent entry or subsequent innovation by other firms. All what you would look at is market share, market definition, market share, you see? And so that's the static way of looking at antitrust, is to say, I look only at market definition, market share. What, uh, and that I'm in complete agreement with Rich Gilbert, which I know you, you invited, Richard Gilbert. And we are completely on the same pace, uh, 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 is that the idea is to say, no, you should practice antitrust well, uh, in a way that takes into account the possible uh, deterring effect that a merger or acquisition would have on subsequent entry and innovation. And that's what was not done in that case. You see, yeah. uh, uh, if it had been done, hopefully, you would not have observed the same decline in productivity growth in the US starting in the early 2000s. So the problem is that the problem was that the, the competition policy was not adapted to the IT and AI revolution. You need to adapt the competition policy to the digital era, making it more, you know, entry and innovation based. So right, and, and yeah. the traditional tools as market share and market definitions exactly. are less exactly. adapted. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. And that's that, that's exactly what you explain also in chapter four, where you yeah. uh, where you, you, right. you write that to assess competitive constraints through the rate of exit and entry of firms yeah. would yeah. better yeah. align the Schumpeterian view yeah. of competition with market reality. On the contrary, yeah. what we have today uh, is that we analyze competitive constraints merely on the analysis of rent, like uh, profitability, market shares, and, and, and market capitalization. Yeah. And that creates a gap between the theoretical approach and the market realities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so antitrust enforcement focuses on rent, market power, market capitalizations, and not on the dynamics of the competitive constraints. Why is that misguided? And, and what are the implications for the current antitrust approach but the problem is that there can be various sources of rents you can have rents because you have entry barriers but you can have rents because you innovate it's a bit like taxation you see i have the same problem uh with thomas piketty my friend in france is uh, you say that look you know you put on the same footing carlos slim and Steve Jobs, you see what I mean? Alors, it's true that the, yeah, yesterday Steve Jobs can become, you know, the innovator of yesterday can become uh, an incumbent of today. So that's another problem. But you have to be careful that some of the rents are due to the fact that you innovated. So you should not penalize the rent per se. You should look where the rents is coming from. So, for example, as much as I am against lobbying, you should regulate lobbying. You should, uh, I know in the U.S., Uh, there is no limit to the extent to which firms can finance political campaigns. I think that's not good. Uh, uh, all those things are bad because they give enormous in, uh, power to the incumbents to prevent, to put entry barriers, in fact. You see what I mean? But, but, that's, so, but that's, not that's, an, that's not an antitrust problem, right? Yeah, that's, not, that's a competition, say, policy. It's not an antitrust, it's a competition. When you fight lobbying, you go for competition. Uh, when you uh, regulate political campaigns, you go for entry because uh, otherwise the incumbents have another, uh, uh, you know, instrument to uh, influence governments. So I think the policy for competition has to be broad ranged. It needs to have antitrust, and we may discuss at the beginning to have a kind of practice of merger and acquisition, which is very much, you know, where you look at the effects on innovation and entry. But on top of that, you also need to regulate lobbying and to regulate the uh, uh, politics, you know, the extent to which firms are involved in politics or not. And I think you need all those instruments to really have effective, uh, 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 to make sure that you don't have entry barriers. But uh, as the, the question you asked me initially is that the rents be careful because you cannot put on the same footing rents that are purely due to entry barriers and rents that are due to just someone who just innovated. You cannot treat them the same way. Exactly. This is the distinction between Schumpeter rent, uh, Schumpeter rent and, and monopoly rents. And, and that is something yeah. to always have in mind uh, yeah. when discussing antitrust enforcement. So we yeah. just said that, yes, uh, competition also enables innovation, right? From competition, you have yeah. uh, innovation. So fierce competition may lead to what you call escape competition innovation. Exactly. Basically, firms innovate to escape yeah. competitive constraints. We can think of niche market, new product, you escape in order to create those markets and those, those products. 
Yeah. Some firms won't be able to cope up with such innovation race, and you call them these innova innovation laggards, right? Uh, so yeah. they are just left behind. Um, so should antitrust worry about these innovation laggards? And in other words, should competition policy intervene to slow down the rate of innovations since innovation harms firms? which are innovation like that's that. Not the, that's not the way. Now, what I would do is to first uh, allow the entrepreneurs of, of laggards to, you know, access financing or to, you know, to make, uh, to, to create a world, you know, by developing the financial sector, uh, 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 that would be very helpful. Uh, uh, you may also uh, have smart industrial policy that, you know, uh, could make use of what they do. I mean, uh, we have to discuss that. Uh, uh, but I would certainly not slow down uh, frontier innovation, no. And the other thing which is very important, is the most important is labor market policies to retrain workers uh, so that they could move from lagging firms to more advanced firms. You see, so that's very important. I think you have to protect uh, uh, individuals more than you protect firms. Uh, yeah. uh, but you should also give the possibility for firms to, you know, uh, access technologies to, you know, to uh, make them possible so that they can catch up. You see what I mean? So that right. that you should do. You should not say that you would not do it by slowing down the, the leaders. You would yeah. do it by helping the laggards. You see what I mean? Right. right. By helping through this. And, and you protect the policies. competitive process as well, right? You exactly. protect the process exactly. of That's very important. Yeah. Creation. Yeah. So yeah. That is yeah. Also. also protecting the process and, of course, having a, a, a concern for those who are left behind. But this is not uh, just the, uh, okay. the, the concern of antitrust. So um, uh, we, we just discussed that uh, competition enables innovations. But there's also another causal relationship I would like to discuss is that, and that's the main premise that antitrust enforcers and scholars uh, rely upon. But the Schumpeterian approach also emphasize that innovation creates competition, right? So innovation does not strike at the margin, but at the very core, as Schumpeter uh, will say, uh, of the market. Do you think that an innovation-based antitrust enforcement would be the best way to secure a fierce competition? Yeah, because I think it would favor entry. You see what I mean? Uh, that's the thing. So right. you want to favor entry, and that's the most, right. uh, with the best way to favor competition is to have and how to, uh, how to favor entrance. And how would you favor entry? What would you, uh, what type of tools or rules would you implement to favor entry? But the, already, as I said, I would prevent, I would regulate things that make it more difficult for entrance. You see what I mean? Lobbying right. is against entrance, financing, you know, various things that are done to make it uh, harder for, even if I do industrial policy, I would do an industrial policy that factors entrance in. You see, sometimes industrial policy is done to only subsidize incumbents, and that makes it harder for entrance. So I would make sure that if I do DARPA, for example, or BARDA type of industrial policy, uh, which yeah. were very successful with, uh, with the vaccine, I would factor in entrance, which BARDA did. I would not just help in, uh, incumbent firms. So right. that, that's a way to, to help entrance. And the other way is to make sure that you have venture capital, institutional investors, a whole ecosystem that yeah. makes it easy to create new firms and to grow. Right. Uh in your book, you also uh, explain some That's of your... That's chapter 12 of the book. Yeah. That's chapter 12 of the book. Right. This, uh, uh, in your book, you explain also that uh, some of your uh, prior publications, and you also say that competition stifles, some too much competition stifles innovation, and because there's, of course, a need for appropriability yeah. of past investments yeah. and for rewarding innovation. And this is the, your, your uh, inverted U relationship between competition and growth. Can you explain to our viewers uh, what yeah. is the inverted alors, U alors, relationship? It's, it's, it's product market competition there that I look at. You have various measures of competition. One measure is, uh, is product market competition, measured by the rents, the, the ratio of profits over value added. Okay, uh, so when that run, when that measure is low, profit over value added, usually you have more competition. So that's one. It's a measure of product market competition. You have another measure of market, uh, market competition, which is entry rate and entry threat. So entry, that's it's always good for innovation to have more uh, entry threat. You see what I mean? So that one, there is no inverted U. When you look at entry as a measure of competition, that's unambiguously good for innovation to have more entry because. You, you you have the challenge of the entry. Okay? That's the process and, of creative yeah, destruction. 
Yeah. Exactly. But if you look at the product market, there you have uh, this inverted U because you have the effect that is true that uh, uh, more, you know, more competition uh, 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 on the product market encourages innovation to escape competition, but that's mainly at, for frontier firms from at the frontier. But it tends to discourage uh, innovation by laggards. And uh, 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 that, and the combine is this inverted U. You see what I mean? It's because you have the effect on the leaders and on the laggards. And, the, and the, the result is this inverted U. Right. And also, when there's too much competition, there, there's a lack of appropriability of uh, the, 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 the product of innovation, right? And that's why... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's right. But you have to be a bit careful because you should not confound everything. You, there is a complementarity, in fact, between patent protection and competition. Right. So you need patent protection for appropriability, but you usually need more competition for innovating. You see, it's true you have the inverted U, but usually we are on the upward of the inverted U. But still, we need property right protection because you see both property right protection and competition enhance the escape competition effect. Because in fact, suppose I live in the same flat as you. More competition means that the flat we live in is, is becoming smaller. And so we want to escape the flat, okay? So the, the, uh, the property right protection secures the new flat where you will move to. You see what I mean? Right. Whereas competition is what makes our flat together smaller. Both right. contribute to make it attractive to escape competition. So in fact, people thought that one was against the other. But in fact, what we explain in the book is that there is a complementarity between patent protection and competition. Exactly. And also by the innovation incentives that patent yeah. cre also uh, create. That's very yeah, important. Exactly. Uh, that's uh, in Europe. We have uh, you may be aware of that this uh, proposal of the uh, Digital Market Act of regulating competition in the uh, digital market, and it's all about creating contestability in the digital market. You talk yeah. about the contestable market, making markets contestable, and digital markets are assumed not to be contestable enough. Um, I mean, at least in Europe, uh, you write that some market may first appear to be monopolist monopolistic, or in fact. A contestable mark, contestable market, competition takes place, threat of entry exit, and the protection of intellectual property rights implies that yeah. some important returns on successful investments are, are made. Yeah. Uh, so the European Union wants to create more contestability in the digital market, although, as you demonstrate, there is an inverted U relationship between competition and innovations. Do you think that the increased contestability in the digital markets that the, the, the Act yeah. wants to foster is an inst with some, for example, instance of mandatory licensing proposals will foster or deplete innovation in the long run? Uh, contestability is really the, uh, the threat of entry. So I think always to increase the threat of entry is a good thing. So I would always be on the side of contestability. I'm very happy that the European Union is moving towards the notion of contestability because, you know, there was a decision of Alstom Siemens, you remember. Uh, and there, you know, they uh, usually I'm, I agree mostly with what the uh, European Commission does. But there, it's not that I don't disagree necessarily, but I wasn't convinced fully because they they uh, turned down the uh, uh, the proposal to uh, to merge Alstom and Siemens on the basis of market share, saying uh, together there will be too big a market. But I think that was insufficient an argument, and that's where you can illustrate very well the difference between the static approach and the dynamic approach. Because it could well be that, you know, Siemens, and it's true that Siemens and Alstom together, they monopolize the market for high-speed trains in Europe. It's true. They have the 100% market share. But it's a contestable market because you can buy trains from China. Exactly. Any, any and, and, and there was, and there was a Chinese competitor. And there was right. a Chinese competitor. So, I mean, they had to put a limit price to, to have that, to, that to happen. They had to put the price sufficiently low, the Germany and France, so that countries will not shift. In fact, uh, Italy, some of the trains, not the high speed, they buy from China already. So right. it's easy to in Europe market. as well. And that, that was not taken, that's a very good example, by the way, of uh, uh, why we need a, a dynamic approach to, uh, to merger with Europe. Because in that case, the European Commission took a static approach and they didn't take into account contestability. And I think it was a contestable market. And therefore, on that basis, they should have allowed the, the, the merger. At least there was the issue. Maybe I don't want to be too affirmative, but at least I was struck by the fact that in their uh, uh, justification, the, uh, they never took that into account. At least they did right. not uh, 
factory in contestability. I mean, that, that's totally right. And the decision was in February 2019. And yeah. And they were saying that the Chinese competitor will not enter like within the next two or three years. Well, six yeah. months later, they were entering at least in Eastern European market oh, in Hungary and Poland. Yeah, so yeah. There was a complete mismatch course, uh, between course, the analysis and, and, yeah, and yeah. that that is uh, that is very interesting because mm -hmm. when you talk about contestability, it's also on the level of, te of 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 the market we analyze. We can see. Uh, market national markets which are no longer right. contestable, but then European or global markets which are of course con contestable. So of course, of course. the contestability market also de de depends on the definition of geographic markets. Absolutely, so that, that that is a very important point. Yeah, and, and yeah. On market concentrations, you, you referred to that uh, earlier. You write in the book that market concentration does not mean does not necessarily mean a decrease of market competition. Today's antitrust paradigm seems far away from this Schumpeterian insight you described in your book. How can you explain that today's antitrust debate disparage scale economies, beneficial leverage effects, in order to return to these old, yeah. small and medium-sized company you? It's very much linked to the question you asked me about rents. You could have rents for good reason and for bad reason. You can have rents because you put entry barriers, or you could have rents because you are better than others. You innovated. So, for example, take a circular model, a circular hoteling model. I, I, I'm a bit technical there. Suppose you and I, we are competing, okay? But you, and suppose we do something that there is more competition between you and I. It's easier for consumers to choose between you and me. In a circular model, I would lower the transport cost. You see, right. voila. Uh, uh, that's an increase in competition. Uh, uh, that, what would, and suppose you have lower production costs than I do. You are better than I am. If you increase competition, the result then will be that you will concentrate more of the market of because you are better. So more concentration may result from more competition. You see what I mean? Because more competition will give more hands to the guy who is best. So it goes back to my previous point, you see. And that's exactly. why concentration cannot be a measure of competition because it may be the equilibrium result of more competition. Well, well that's more that, then, then the objective of deconcentrating the market <laughs> for antitrust enforcers looks like misguided, isn't it? It is a, it is a misguided. That's that that that, that is except a if you see except yeah. if you see that you have always the same incumbents they prevent entry you see what I mean you could be a reason but then it's another reason you could say there is someone too strong and because he's too strong he captures the government and therefore I need to break them up do you see what I mean because but that's they are, political power because, because they are too exactly they are too strong and they lobby too much so that yeah. might be a reason for break up but to, lo to lower the lobbying. That's that's right, uh, but I will say that this is not an antitrust problem. There will be political campaign financing laws or different regulations or laws or, that or regulation regulating lobbying. Yeah, that like this is uh, also a different, but that would be a uh, pu purely antitrust uh, problem. But no, no. But, but yeah, the regulations, sectoral regulations, could make sense in that in that sense. So. Yeah. Uh, I would just want to, because you referred to DARPA on the US yeah. uh, DARPA uh, program, and you, of course, discuss that in your book and say, like, this is the kind of program's role that uh, the state has, uh, has delivered some beneficial uh, extent. So you advocate for a robust industrial policy, and also partly because of the path dependency problem. And you, yeah, and you refer yeah, to the yeah, Q, yeah. QRT problems uh, of innovations and inventions. You refer to the U.S. DARPA as a pro positive program, uh, but today we see China's Chinese aggressive competition with Western companies. So why does it? Wh why the antitrust blindness on an industrial policy uh, with having small firms uh, only is misguided in light of the need to have uh, an industrial policy? Why? Yeah, but, uh, because I think they are, you see, they are a priori legalistic. You see, say, so, you know, never have, we need industrial policy on top. There was the view, of course, that if you have industrial policy, it would go against competition because you would uh, pick winners, the state would pick winners, the government, okay, uh, right. uh, uh, and you would bias competition. So on that ground, people like Anne Kruger and others in the 90s said, avoid industrial policy. But in yeah. fact, countries do it anyway. 
So yes. let's do it. So instead, it's like the don't ask, don't tell. Since they, everybody does it, why not acknowledge you do it? But let's have governance rules. So the idea, and what I've looked a lot into and I'm putting the book, is uh, the idea that you should have pro-competition industrial policy. Right. You should make industrial policy competition friendly. So industrial policy is the idea that you can pick sectors, that you can say in some sectors, I need to, I mean, for example, digital and, uh, right. or uh, health, we saw with uh, the Barda, or energy, because we have objectives which are important. Uh, digital era is important in itself. Health is important in itself. Uh, uh, energy, we need to move towards green innovation. Uh, right. So for these reasons, we need to intervene. And, and this sector will not do the job, as you said very accurately. And that's what we say in chapter nine of the book. Firms left on their own, if they innovated in, the, in uh, polluting technologies in the past, they will not spontaneously invest in clean technology today. You need state intervention. So you need uh, uh, carbon tax, but you also need industrial policy. Uh, but yeah. the industrial policy that you have should be uh, uh, poor competition. It means that you don't just need, you help one firm, you, you help many firms, you let many right. firms do. Barda is a very good example. Barda is the Biologic Advanced Research Development Agency right. in the US, so which took the ANR messenger technology and in last one, one year, turned it into massive vaccine production, okay? But what they have is money comes from the government, the American government, and then they have team leaders, and the team leader, they are in charge of doing public partner, private uh, partnerships, and to elicit projects for many people. So that's very competitive at that level. You have Moderna, Pfizer, many, 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 and many that failed, and they elicit many projects, and then they see what works or not, and then they produce. You see, so it's done in a way which is very much for competition. So DARPA and BARDA is a nice way because it has some top-down elements. Uh, 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 you need to coordinate resources to make the transition from basic research to massive, to quickly massive application. For the BARDA, it was to produce a vaccine against COVID in one less than one year. But in the DARPA, the Defense Administration Project Agency of the 50s, it was to put a man in space and to uh, race against the Soviet Union. On, right. on, on weaponry, okay? So they had, uh, the basic research had been done that you had to quickly move to uh, uh, well-defined missions and well-defined applications. So that you need uh, top-down, but the, that was done in a way that preserved the competition. And that, right. I think, DARPA and BARDA is very interesting. But more generally, you have to do, you have to acknowledge in some areas for defense reason, for energy and, and, and environmental reason, or for health reason, you need to privilege them. But you have to do it in a way that preserves competition and entry. That, that's and that's very it. interesting because then you will you will, uh, uh, you will preserve and you will sustain some industries and sectors rather than specific firms. Exactly. So exactly. You you avoid the accusation of picking winners and picking exactly. losers. Exactly. That's and it. you and you allow entry. You don't only yes. help incumbents. Very important. Yes. Factor yes. in entry. And that's right. Uh, well, ATF's president, Rob Atkinson, has, has, has written extensively on, on these issues of having some strategy on some industries. But this is not about picking up winners and, and, no, and precisely no. subsidizing no. specific companies. It's also helping the future technologies, and as you just yeah, rightly yeah. described. And this is uh, very important. And that's also the, the other side of the competition policy that we, we can have. Competition yeah, policy yeah. cannot do everything, and innovation yeah. policy wider can help uh, competition policy, right? Yeah, so this, yeah. is a, this is a very interesting uh, insight. Uh, on, on the book, on chapter four, you write that the French firms do not achieve a sufficient size as opposed to the US firms. And th this leads also to less efficient and less innovative firms to remain on the market, just like less efficient firms staying. So the power of creative destruction is not at full space, at full pace in, in France as compared to yeah. the to the US, and you identified yeah. two reasons, limited yeah. access for private equity, as just said, yeah. and the threshold effect of regulations. Yeah. Can you explain Absolutely. on these two uh, yeah. reasons? Yeah, so for example, in France, you have, uh, and I, I wrote a recent paper with, uh, with John Van Rinen and uh, uh, Antonin Bergeau on regulation, uh, on regulation and innovation. And what we show is that, you know, in France, you have a labor regulation that makes it very, once you reach more than 50 employees, Many bad things happen to you. So you have really a big threshold at 50, what 50. And what you see is that firms, when they approach 550, they tend to innovate less 
because they're afraid that by innovating, they would go above 50. You see, so that's very bad. That, that that's, way you're doing. That's voila. the best that's threshold nice. effect. That's so the best threshold effect you can beautiful. have. It's a beautiful thing. So voilà, you can look at my paper. They're very so voila. that's regulation uh, uh, on on the financial development. It's true that uh, uh, in the U.S. you can go much more. When I was living in Harvard, uh, uh, the, you had the consul uh, from Paris, the consul of France, and he said most of his time he would spend with people coming from France who could not continue. Uh, the activities in France because they would not find the funding to go, and that's why they needed to go to the US. And so we the big problem is the that, and that's why then that's the the latest, a Nobel Prize. Uh, yeah, so. Exactly, well, exactly. So that, that you need, and that's why venture capital, uh, uh, private equity, uh, institutional investors, all that apparatus is very uh, helpful. We don't have that well developed in in France at all. That, that's very important. Yeah. And precisely to come back to the uh, Digital Market Act of the European Union, I mean, to some extent, that act creates a huge threshold effect because it regulates digital gatekeepers and exempt yeah. digital rivals, right? So there's a regulation yeah. for yeah. some digital gatekeepers, but not for other yeah. Yeah, that's rivals, right. other companies. Do, you, do yeah. you see that, this threshold effect, as an innovation deterrence? It might, it might actually. But I, I'm not specialized in the on, on the market. I should look in detail, but uh, we should talk about that. But a priori, that would, I would, anything that creates threshold effects of that kind, uh, I think, are, are not a good thing. Yeah. Right. So for the same the, reason as, um, as the labor regulation, but we should... it doesn't create a level playing field. And well, uh, exactly. It, so then you bias competition. Exactly, exactly. So mm. the process uh, of creative destruction, as you explained in the whole in the whole book, uh, is an endless process, and and it's a it's a dynamic, long term approach that helps better understand and assess the competitive constraints. And yet, antitrust enforcement is either backward looking and saying like you look at yeah. past market positions to explain exactly. today's market, exactly. or it is short term, as we just referred with Alstom and Siemens. It looks at two or three years. Exactly forward exactly. And, exactly. and not further how can we reconcile the need for a long-term dynamic approach to competition with the current short view uh, uh short-term view of antitrust enforcement how, how can we just reconcile that that you should ask i mean gilbert i mean his book is entirely about how to redesign competition policy my book is not about that we we yeah. identify the problem and we say we should go in that direction uh, how you would do in detail to, it's a practice, it's mostly a practice. You have to have a practice of competition policy, which is different, like the practice of industrial policy in Europe. I mean, for example, uh, 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 you know, 10 years ago, the Competition Commission in, uh, in Brussels was totally against any form of, of uh, sectoral state aid. Now they acknowledge the fact that you may need industrial policy. Right. And they right. acknowledge the fact that should, you know, talk to the people who do uh, who think about industrial policy at, at New Brussels. So they, they evolve, you see what I mean? They, yeah, uh, of course. But they, they should go in that direction of, of saying, well, we factor in entry, we, we look at the effect of merger and acquisition on entry innovation, we, uh, we are more forward looking and, and we reconcile smart industrial policy with competition policy because Europe needs to reindustrialize. I mean, really, uh, uh, you can see that in many areas, Europe has lost three, but we saw with the vaccines. Uh, you know, the good vaccines came from the US, not from Europe. Uh, that's, I mean, I, that's a wake up call. Uh, we need to create the, 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 the European equivalent of the BARDA, the European equivalent of the ARPA energy. We need to create that and to move in that direction, but to do that in a way that preserves competition, I mean, that preserves contestability. I mean, that's what's right. important. But the stability, entry rate, those are the things you have to keep a watch for. You don't want right. to reduce on the stability and entry rate. Right. right. I mean, yeah. So the, the, the Europe Europe gap is not only on digital markets, as you just say, it's also on pharmaceutical industries. And, and, exactly. And that, this is exactly. very important. So perhaps yeah. how to reconcile the dynamic approach with the current approach. Uh, there's on, on the market definition rules that we have, there's too little of uh, uh, room for potential competition, right? Uh, this, there's always this uh, two or three years analysis. How can we, uh, we need to uh, analyze market in a dynamic way, but how can we analyze market with a five year uh, perspective, which is very hard, uh, right? Yeah, you're right. I mean, you have to make prospective, you have to make the prediction, but you know, things you could do, you have various ways to do that. First, you could look at other countries who did it. 
So you right. could say, well, you know, what happened in the US when they did this or that or in other countries? So you can learn from other countries. Uh, you know, it's not the same thing, but you can learn from others. You could experiment as well. You could say, but maybe that policy, I experiment and see what you learn from the experiment. And then the rest is to calibrate models where you have uh, models with some dynamics. Uh, and I think you need to analyze competition policy in uh, using firms with innovation and firm dynamics and calibrate those models and then be able to say, well, in the context of those models, what would I do or not? Right. That, that, that is a very those important three ways. You, you yeah. use uh, benchmarking, you use experimentation, um, RCT uh, as much as you can, I don't know, experimentation, and you use calibrating uh, models uh, grow, you know, that, uh, that have competition from dynamics and innovation together and, and, right. and use that. Yeah. And, all, and also, if you, need, if you use uh, benchmarking, there's also a need for better coordination between antitrust agencies, right? Because there's different ways of yeah. looking at competition in the US, in Europe, or, or even in China. Yeah. We're yeah. talking yeah. about China, but uh, antitrust enforcement in China is very, uh, is very different uh, and very questionable to some extent. And so, to, to that extent, we need more global cooperation on antitrust. Do you, do you agree? It, yeah, but you need more than that. With China, you need to rethink WTO. I think right. where, there were Trump. Trump was wrong to put a, a, a big tariff to everybody. That I think was wrong. But the where he was not wrong to be too late is to is to raise the issue that China didn't play quite by the rule. I mean, they, they it's not necessarily that they violated the rules of WTO, but they right. played the rules in a way which was not right. You see what I mean? Right. They they uh, well, they uh, sometimes you know there is what is in the contract. Sometimes you have what's explicit in the contract and what's implicit in the contract. At the spirit, the contract, the spirit and the letter. Maybe there is spirit in the letter, but not the spirit. So right. that has to be that has to be changed. You cannot. You need to have loyal competition. Competition is important. It has to be loyal. Of course, and in competition, we see that in a sense that China is also subsidizing and manipulating its own company exactly. in order to export, in order to enter Western yeah. uh, uh, markets. And and this should be uh, the end of perhaps some naivety. And, yeah, uh, and so the, I think the threat, I think you need the carrot and the stick. I think you need to propose cooperation, but you right. have always the stick of some barriers. You see what I mean? At least you have to be tough in the negotiation. Well, you need to, to say, well, you know, competition has to be fair. Yes. And, and we have, and, uh, so the, it doesn't mean we should raise tariffs, but at least the uh, European Union could have uh, the threat of tariffs uh, 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 smartly used. Well, well, hopefully not to be used in equilibrium, but uh, at, uh, as an out of equilibrium threat, at least. Yeah. But then you, you suggest that there should be a transatlantic front or tra transatlantic, transatlantic yeah. more now, alliance yes, now we can have, on these I think, issues. Yes, with now something we, we don't have. have. But maybe now with Biden, it will be easier, hopefully. That's right. Uh, that's that's also what the European Commission has proposed, yeah. the tech partnerships. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but things like the Digital Markets Act looks like it's targeting American companies and this creates but, some resentment. But, you see, but on the other hand, you saw Biden uh, moving in the direction of saying they should pay tax everywhere. They should right. not have tax havens. So right. if he goes in the direction of denouncing pollution havens and tax havens, uh, that that will be that's those are steps in a good direction. That will make it easier to to uh, to uh, to make to, to have agreements with them. That's right. That's that's what is uh, very necessary on yeah. the global stage. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, before we go to the uh, Q and A and some questions and answers from yeah. from from the from the uh, from our viewers just a final question of what would be the general advice you would give to antitrust enforcers and antitrust reformers because we see a lot of reforms going on what kind of general advice you would give for improving antitrust enforcement in general now the general advice is really to combine uh, 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 is to have a view of antitrust which is more conducive of innovation. So one thing is to say, in the way you do merger and acquisition, factor in the effects on innovation. But the other thing is also not to be completely closed to industrial policy, which is aimed at spurring innovation in some areas. Right. You see what I mean? Right. Uh, yes. uh, uh, but make sure that it's com com compatible with competition. So in those two right. dimensions, those are the two ways to factor in innovation. The one way right. is in your practice, you look at the effect on innovation of a merger, but it's also don't uh, 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 be open to uh, articulate your policy with uh, smart industrial policy. 
Right. So, I mean, I have, uh, we can say that uh, perfect uh, competition is the enemy of good competition, right? Sometimes imperfect competition, imperfect yeah. competition, as Schumpeter described it, uh, imperfect competition is somehow necessary in order to leverage and to exercise market power. Would you agree with that? Well, I would not put it this way, but I said, you know, don't, when you talk about runs, don't be against any kind of runs. They are the innovation runs. Uh, yeah. be against the rents that are uh, due to just, uh, you know, uh, entry barriers. So you have to be very, you know, well, you, you, need to, you need to make sure where is your target. You see, where is it? Where, 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 where are you targeting? Not rents per se. You target entry, power, entry barrier, you see, or you target, uh, well, you, you just have to be sh to make sure you don't, uh, you know, jeter le bébé avec le sale du bain, as we say in French. But uh, uh, yeah, um, throwing the baby with the water, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a difficulty. Yeah. yeah. It's it's the same expression. All right. All right. Thank, thank you very much. So we You're have a, we have a, a number of questions. We have many questions yeah. from the uh, yeah. from yeah. from the audience. Uh, so how we, we've touched about we touch about uh, talk upon it. Uh, how do you think competition policy may change in the West as a result of the increasing competition for technology leadership with China? Uh, but it's, I think it will be to uh, uh, to be more open to innovation. I think that's precisely. I think they will uh, now. There is a call for you know creating ERA or BARDA, uh, European level or these kind of things. And uh, I think competition policy has to accommodate uh, the fact right. that you will have European projects uh, right. uh, of the kind that you had in the US well, with DARPA, yeah. ARPA Energy, and BARDA. So I think that's the big, the big step forward. And that, and, and that, I hope, when you do, you decide on antitrust, you won't repeat the same reasoning as you did with, uh, with uh, Siemens and, uh, and Alstom. Right, that's right. Um, the contestability cannot... will, be, will be factored in more. Yeah. Exactly. We cannot ignore or see manipulation of competition policy yeah. in China, right? So of course, of course, this, of course. This, we can talk about currency manipulations, but there's also yeah. competition manipulation. Uh, another question. Do you think that modern antitrust European enforcement should take into consideration industrial and technological development, but also crisis uh, legal framework? So, for example, what do you think about... Uh, the application of antitrust policy during the COVID uh, pandemic and during crisis, should should there be an exemption? Should there be some uh, possibility for corporations, for even temporary, perhaps, cartels, things like that? What, do you think it's... Uh, yeah, no, that's always a complication. Uh, it's true that, you know, you have the danger, sometimes big firms, there is a lot of human capital in big firms, you see, and uh, and you want to preserve the human capital that will not be reallocated easily. So it's true that to some extent, I don't say you should freeze the economy and have only zombies. I don't say that. But it's true that sometimes during crisis, you have to preserve the human capital. When Obama helped General Motors, uh, he was concerned about the human capital in General Motors. So... Right. You have to, you need there to have uh, the possibility to help, possibly even, it's not like nationalizing, but sometimes some big firms, uh, you may have to, the state may have to step in to make sure that you preserve the human capital. Yeah. Uh, yeah because, you, because you have financial market incompleteness, financial right. market so, perception. Yeah. Times of crisis can explain, justify some antitrust exemptions, uh, time for yeah. exemptions, is what you mean. That's right, that's uh, right. What do you believe? Do you believe that the field of antitrust, because it's normally a very niche field, right? Uh, do you feel that? Do you believe that the field of antitrust would be more popular in the coming years, uh, or it will just re remain as it is uh, today as a more expert field? I, I, I hope it will be more popular because we know that the key to resuming growth is there in big part. So we know that uh, it's, uh, it goes beyond now. Macroeconomists are interested in competition policy. You know, I work with uh, Pete Clino, with uh, Timo Bopart. They are, you know, my friends who work with me. Uh, they are ma uh, primary macroeconomists. But of course, now that we've done this study on, for, you know, that which is uh, reported in Chapter 6 on uh, rising rents and falling growth, they, they are very much after competition policy. Exactly. So that's what... Coming from a growth, being growth economist. They are primarily okay, macro growth well. Yeah. Exactly, the reconciliation between microeconomics yeah. and macroeconomics, Absolutely. where exactly. the profitability yeah. of the firms can spur yeah. growth, economic national growth. So that's, that's a right. very interesting yeah. answer. Uh, 
Well, I mean, I would have thousands of questions still left, but uh, I want to. We went through these uh, forty-five minutes. I, I, I really want to thank you uh, warmly for this great, great pleasure. pleasure. So that's the book pleasure. of, of yeah. uh, Philippe Aguillon. And, and this is the English version. Exactly. Yeah. So you can either you read French or you read English or you want to compare the two versions. You can buy both. Uh, you have uh, this book of Power of Creative Destructions just out this month at Harvard University Press. And this is an amazing book that uh, recap decades of knowledge and of research and of teaching. And uh, we've been very pleased to, to have you and to yeah, have this uh, yeah. book. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.